The following announcement has been paid for by the Wrestling Epicenter. Hey guys. Hello, ladies. Remember me? <laughs> Let me talk to you, dummies. It's now time. It's beer time. Tick tock. It's showtime. For the longest running wrestling talk show in history. We are huge. It's gonna be cool. You're where it's at. You're smart like me. Tune in each and every week. You better keep listening. Or I'll come out of your computer and, and turn it on for you. Or else I'm gonna kick your stick and teeth then. We've been known by a few names. The needs of the many far outweigh the needs of the few. The interactive interview. Interactive interview. Oh, yeah. Interactive interview. The interactive interview. Interactive interview. The interactive interview. The Blaze. Blaze, 1260 AM. The Blaze. The Blaze. Blaze. The Blaze Rock. Interactive Wrestling Radio. Interactive Wrestling Radio. Interactive Wrestling Radio. Interactive Radio. Interactive Radio. radio. Testify. Interactive Wrestling Radio. And a lot of other names. Weekend Warriors of Wrestling. The Pile Driver. The Pile Driver. Three Count Wrestling. <laughs> the Hour Lab. But it's all one show. The Wrestling Epicenter. Wrestling Epicenter. The Wrestling Epicenter. The Epicenter. Wrestling Epicenter, dude. The Wrestling Epicenter. Don't get off. And your host from day one. By ignorance or arrogance. James Walsh. Wake up, sleepyheads. Dr. Carolus. It all starts. Oh, tough guy. Thank you very much. Rock, what a rush. <laughs> Dumb down. Get out of my face. <laughs> So what you're going to do when Blazemania runs wild on you? Now. Hey, this is Chris Jericho of Fozzie, and you're listening to the Interactive Interview. And remember, we are huge rock stars. Welcome back to Interactive Wrestling Radio. Joining us on the Newsmaker line for the first time in 14 years is a gentleman who kind of waltzed his way back into our living rooms just a few nights ago on AEW Dynamite, the legendary... Gary Michael Capetta. Mr. Capetta, are you with me? I'm with you, but Walsh is a lot more delicate than what you saw Wednesday night. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a lot of fun to see you back on the television. The, to see the world's most dangerous announcer back uh, behind the microphone was really cool to see. Nice. Yeah, it was fun to do. Very, very much uh, a lot of fun. All right. So was it cool for you to be back in front of... That many people. They've got, a, you know, 5,000 people in the crowd chanting, uh, screaming and chanting and screaming and carrying on once again after 25 years away from that size of a crowd. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a hot crowd. Um, I, was a, I was a bit uncertain, you know, to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. um, I had just been notified three days before. And uh, my first instinct was uh, to walk away from it. Um, but they they said no. Nah, you can, we want you to do this. <laughs> oh really? They they sort of talked me into it. Yeah. Well, who who contacted you if you don't mind me asking? Um, it was he's a a, a vice president under Tony Khan. Oh, awesome, awesome. So I mean, and I told you this on social media that that's been kind of a talk of other podcasts of late that some of them had said, isn't it great that we live in a wrestling world where we might get to see Gary Michael Capetta on national television one more time? And, you know, that would kind of, when the comment was made, I thought, huh, that's interesting. I never really thought it would happen. So when I heard, when I heard it happen, I jumped off my couch. <laughs> yeah, I, I had heard something about that too. It was kind of a crazy week because I had heard, um, you know, that, podcast kind of chatter mm -hmm. and then then i get contacted on sunday um by aew and then as the week went on i heard that booker t told some kind of a story on fs1 about um a conversation he and i had years ago mm. and um yeah i mean so it was all one after another yeah your name is uh, all over the place right now what did you think of Chris Jericho's little pot shot at you that that's why WCW went out of business when the funny thing is he was in WCW later than you were? 
<laughs> I told David Penzer, I said, you know, I took a bullet for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, Chris is just um, masterful. He, um, if you look at what, and I, I don't know whether he thought this out or whether it's just his his great natural instincts, but if you look at what he said to me, he belittled me, but he didn't berate me. Mm. There's a difference. There's a difference between the two. Um, yeah, that was all Chris. I mean, that was the entire segment was um, his vision. Mm. And um, I had spoken to him. Uh, well, he had sent me a, a video of what he envisioned. And um, that's what got me a little more comfortable with because because he had heard that I was uh, eh, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to do this, and uh, he was intent on it happening, and he was intent on me doing it. Oh wow! And he um, so he sent along a video for me to see his vision, and when I saw his vision, I said, "Oh yeah, I, I can do that." That's you know. So um, and then I uh, I spoke with him in this dressing room um, earlier in the day, so. Um, yeah, I didn't know exactly what he I had no idea exact. In fact, I couldn't really understand the first insults because the crowd was so loud. Mm -hmm. I just knew that he was insulting me, so I reacted to a general insult. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> so your friend, the, the one who gave you the moniker that I used earlier on, the world's most dangerous manager, Jim Cornette, um, he kind of said that when Dave Brown, who had never been on national TV before up until a couple months ago, they, they brought him out and he called one match. He said, I don't think Dave Brown's ever done drugs before, but I'm pretty sure he thinks he has after seeing the way these guys work today. What did you think of the AEW work style and, and how unbelievably oh God, acrobatic, I guess would be the word, you, that it is now? Well, I, I'm familiar with it. I mm. keep up with um, the current products on uh, a few of the different prom promotions. Mm -hmm. Um, I have seen, um, a change in, um, AEW and I, I think, and this is just a, this is just a guess on my part that it's a result of the coaches that they brought in, like, um, Arn Anderson, Tully Blanchard and, um, uh, Billy Gunn and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um, Dean Lamenko, uh, Dean Malenko. Um, I, I've, I've seen them, um, get a little bit more grounded. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't, it's not the flying that I, I have a problem with in, in any promotion in pro wrestling. It's, um, uh, when people do things that are not logical, right. Um, uh, that, that's when I have a, I, I don't understand it. I don't get it. Um, if you're trying to bring people into the moment, um, you, you wouldn't do something that was illogical in a situation in which your goal is either to pin someone or make them submit. Mm. Um, I, I think we, we really just can't get away from that basic um, quality of, of, of what pro wrestling is. W once you do that, then it's not pro wrestling, and it's fine if, if it entertains people, but then call it something different. That's but once you start doing things that are illogical towards those goals, um, then you, you lose me. Right, and that's kind of what something sprang up a couple, uh, well, I guess it's almost a year ago now, where somebody called it, it's not wrestling anymore, it's performance art. And I don't know, that kind of made my skin crawl, i got to be honest, when I heard that phrase. Um, yeah, I, yeah I, you can call it that, but we still need to, to keep to, to um, reaching the goals that, you know. Now, I think that the, the bottom line is that too many of today's wrestlers are impatient mm -hmm. and they, they need some kind of a reaction from the crowd every 45 seconds. Mm -hmm. And if you think of it that way, that makes perfect sense as to why there's little selling, why, um, you know, it's strike after strike after strike, um, as opposed to, Understanding that if you're working well, you can have a, a silent audience that's taking in everything that you're doing. Mm. A, the, re, the only reaction isn't necessarily a wow reaction. Right, or this is awesome, chanting, things like that. Yeah. Exactly. 
and it doesn't mean you're not entertaining, um, you know, folks. It doesn't mean that at all. I mean, we always had different um, different styles, but usually there were different styles in one card. I think that you fall into a trap of everybody wrestling the same style. Mm-hmm. Uh, it would be like going to a concert and hearing the same song over and over and over again. Exactly. After a while, you, you know, you're going to be you're going to be beyond that as an audience member. Yeah. <laughs> start start booing the second time. They, there's a movie called The Wedding Singer, and they, they have one of the singers who's like a, a transgender, and, and they sing, Do You Really Want to Hurt Me? And that's the only song they know. So after like the fourth time, the, the audience starts turning and throwing things at them, and that's kind of what sprang to mind when you just said that. So, Well, yeah. I mean, th- you know, think about it. You, it it's, it's good to have um, variety. Um. Where I really saw a turnaround with AEW mm-hmm. was um, the dynamite that they did from the cruise ship, um, where they didn't have the space, and the first row audience was right up on the ring, mm-hmm. so there wasn't a large um, uh, floor space around the ring to do a lot of uh, dives, to do a lot of wrestling outside the ring. And it, it, it forced the wrestlers to stay in the ring. And, and what did I see when that happened was how well a lot of the young flying guys know their wrestling, know their basic holds. If you go back and you watch the Chris Jericho Cruz mm-hmm. episode of Dynamite, you'll, you'll see what I'm saying. Oh, I agree. I, was, I noted that when yeah. I happened. Yeah, I said the same thing because there's not enough room to do that stuff. So kind of force the hand to make them wrestle. Yeah. Because some people would say, oh, yeah, but, they, you know, because they don't know how to. You know, I, it, they, people always make this into a generational thing, and it's not. Mm. It's not. But 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 you'll have an old fogey that'll say, yeah, because they, they don't know how to wrestle. Well, they of course they know how to wrestle. They do. It's mm. um, and, and, and you saw you saw that. You, it, it was. Um, and, and now that as the weeks have gone on, I've seen more and more of that. That's a great and call. as long as that happens. Yeah. I mean, as long as that happens. um there's so much talent. What a what a, a, a terrific crew they are, and they were very welcoming to me. Mm. So I I, I really um, appreciated that. Now the the comment that was made leading into this, or it may have been completely unconnected, was that Tony Khan has such respect for the industry. Did you get a chance to talk to Tony Khan, and and how was he towards you? Um, yeah, when uh, <laughs> when I uh, sort of um, was uncertain about going in to do it. Um, the, the the original gentleman that contacted me said, mm-hmm. why don't you give Tony a call? I'd like to talk to him. So I said, okay. So Sunday night I, I gave him a call. He called me right back. And, um, yeah, I mean, he was very, he was very aware of my entire career. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, he was, uh, we, we talked a little bit about Ring of Honor and uh, my WCW days. We didn't go, I don't think we went back to the WWF days, but <laughs> that was, um, that was way before, but you know he's, he's he's somewhat of a historian too. He's very, um, yeah, he was very complimentary and he was very um, encouraging. You might have already said. Se- I'm sorry to interrupt, but you might have already said it. But what was your apprehension? What did what made you think ah, I don't want to do this? Um, well, it was first presented to me as hosting a segment. Ah, it, it wasn't presenting to me as presented to me as a way in. Um, and so I'm a ring announcer. I, I don't, you know, hosting a segment isn't just something that, um, I'm known to do. Mm -hmm. Then you're, I knew that they wanted this segment to promote their main event pay-per-view match. So I knew that it was very important. And then you're going into live television. So there's no retake. There's, then you're working with a, a technical crew that you've never worked with before. Mm-hmm. So there are certain things that they assume that you know when I know it's been 25 years since I've done a major production. Mm-hmm. I mean, the last time I did a production, I didn't even have wireless. I, I, you know, I was hardwired to the truck. So there were all these factors that, um, you know, and then I was very protective of myself. Too. So, I, I if I was going to come back on a, a major stage, I wanted to be sure that I had everything possible working in my favor. 
And all of those things were not in my favor. <laughs> Absolutely. So we talked a little bit off air about both being New Jersey born. And uh, they announced at the pay-per-view that they're doing a, a match that I'm sure you're very familiar with. It, they can't use the name, but it's the match beyond. It's War Games. And uh, they're going to be doing it in Newark, New Jersey. Any thoughts on if you do another introduction for AEW if they asked you in Newark? Um, well, I spoke to I spoke to them after after the show Wednesday night, mm -hmm. and it's possible that they may you know bring me back for a, a to, you know to do something else with them. There was nothing specific mentioned, and um, yeah, I would consider anything that they they brought forward. Very cool. Um, what was it like running into Jim Ross and, and Tony Schiavone again? I don't know if you've seen them much over the past couple of years. Yeah, only in passing at conventions. Mm -hmm. um, I was in, um, they have a, 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 the dressing room for announcers and coaches. So we were all in the same uh, dressing room, mm -hmm. um, along with Justin Roberts, who I know from his college days from the past. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I met Taz. I had never met Taz before. Um, it was great seeing them and catching up and sharing some uh, WCW memories with them. Mm -hmm. All right. So I mentioned, um, you mentioned David Penzer, and I had David Penzer on just after we lost Roddy Piper, because for a time there, especially around his book tour, he was Roddy's representation. And we talked about Roddy and things, but he, we also talked about his career, and he basically sang your praises. He said that you taught him so much, and you basically put him at ease with getting used to being the guy to call WCW, to be the uh, the ring announcer for WCW during those years, those Nitro years. Um, what do you think of David Penzer, and uh, what did he think of your, your taking the bullet for him? It was, uh, David's terrific. He's, he's a terrific guy. I, I, like to, I like to think that maybe it's karma that, um, um, I mean, I, I knew that I was leaving WCW, and um, I, and I wanted David to get his good a start as he could, and maybe that karma came back to me last Wednesday when the folks at AEW, you know, treated me so well and um, made me feel comfortable. Awesome. Um, that's pretty cool. I, I never thought of that before. Um, but I, I did say to him after Wednesday, I said, you know, I, I took a bullet for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I wasn't there when, when WCW uh, went under. He said, you know, my son said the same thing to me. <laughs> it was like, you didn't think of that? Come on. <laughs> Capetta's there for you one more time. Awesome. Um, David, uh, when I did my um, uh, my state show in Tampa, David came out and, and saw the show. And uh, I was able to see him there. And I've seen him at conventions um, since then. And, yeah, he's, he's, he's top notch. He's a stand-up guy. Like, I like David a lot. Awesome, awesome. And the last time we talked to you, you were promoting your book. I think you were also starting the to dabble into doing your, your one-man show. Um, how how did you enjoy the book tour that you did and also the one-man one show, the Body Slam tour? I had a, a great time with the, uh, with the stage show tour. Mm -hmm. I went out for uh, two years and traveled a lot of the country. Mm -hmm. um, drew a very... Um, educated audience. Um, it, you know, pretty much I was telling stories from the book, and as I'm telling stories, you're seeing a giant screen video overhead of what I'm talking about. Uh -huh. um, and it's, it's a two-hour show with a 15-minute intermission, and at the end, I'll, I take questions from the audience. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very educated crowd. Um, wrestling fans have incredible memories. Like, they will ask me things... Um, like I have no recollection of, you know, like over the 40 years. They'll say, oh, do you remember, you know, um, May 16th, 1993, you were in Joplin, Missouri? And it's like, nah, I, I don't say no, but, uh, you know, like I've learned how to deflect that kind of question <laughs> because I don't want to minimize a person's, you know, memory. Mm. But you will find uh, one, of, one of the first things that I do in the stage show is I take the mic, I go into the audience, and I ask them how they found their way to wrestling. How did they, how did they discover pro wrestling? And nine times out of ten, they'll associate it with a family member or a close friend. Um, I used to watch it with my grandfather, or my buddy and I used to go to the matches. And, and I think, 
I would have to say more than any other sport, um, those memories that wrestling fans hold near and dear to their heart have to do with like a collegial feeling with, with people that they love and people that are important in their lives. And I think that's where the, um, the emotion comes from. Mm. Um, and because uh, every night, every night when I would go into the audience, I would find it, the answers to be very, very similar. Didn't matter whether I was in Chicago or Tampa. Didn't matter Indianapolis or New York City. It was the same, the same theme over and over again. It's what brings us all together, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Amazing. It is amazing. Wrestling is a great thing. I know there's a lot of, uh, the word is toxi toxicity. Toxicity? I don't know if I'm saying that right, but there's a lot of that online. But it ultimately, underneath it all, we all kind of have a mutual understanding and, and appreciation for each other as, as huge fans of this stuff. So it's, it's incredible. I think, I think what's going on, um, what's been going on more recently um, about, um, you know, the, the sport has evolved. And the sport has involved in a great deal for the better. Um, and I think because of the Internet and because over these past decades, younger people have been able to view wrestling styles from different parts of the world that they're now, you know, incorporated in U.S. wrestling. Mm -hmm. And those older folks that haven't explored that haven't been exposed to that. And, you know, we had um, individuals back in WCW who would be flyers, and there always have been flyers but, and, and strikers, but um, there's, there's a sort of like a misunderstanding, I think. But I, it, it's no different than any other entertainment form. For instance, when, um, when Garth Brooks first did his big arena tour, and he was hanging from the rafters, and uh, he, he would uh, um, propel onto the stage. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there were some old, old school country pickers saying, "Oh my God, what is he doing? Like that's not country music." <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, um, I think that if you had uh, old school actors, um, and and they look today and they see all of the animation and all the action and all of it, and maybe a, uh, a lesser amount of a, like a good story that's being told, mm -hmm. just to like a human interactive story, they would say the same thing about, oh, you know, this industry is going to hell. Mm -hmm. So it's not any, I, I went to a drum and bugle corps competition last summer, mm -hmm. and it was very different from what I remember in the past. So it's not just wrestling that experiences these kinds of growing pains, and unfortunately, just by the nature of what I'm describing, it sometimes pits one generation against another. Mm -hmm. And I'll never be an old guy who says, ah, everything in the past was great, and <laughs> you know, this is just not. Um, because I, I, I think we also have a tendency to forget about the stuff that wasn't so great in the past. Yeah. And things that were done in the past that were not believable at all. Rose-tinted glasses. Yeah, and we just overlook them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because we had, like, the Beast. And, well, Gorilla Monsoon. Gorilla Monsoon, when he first debuted in um, the WWF, he was the Manchurian Giant. He was a Hulk who didn't speak English. He just grunted, and he had Wild Red Berry, who was his manager. So, <laughs> I mean, how, how, you know, realistic is that? And then, somehow, the fans just accepted that this guy became a very well-spoken individual. <laughs> I mean, he disappeared for a few months, and he came back, and, and now all of a sudden he has a vocabulary. Yep. So a lot of the old-time fans have a tendency to overlook and forget those things, and they, they really shouldn't do that at all. Because I'd just like to see one, you know, everyone can have their favorites. I mean, not everyone should, should like the same thing, right. but just be accepting of others. And once again, I'm going to get back to it just so it's logical toward one guy beating another guy by pinning or submitting. So here's an interesting question, and if you don't want to talk about this, we won't. And I'll even cut it from the audio, but 
I vaguely remember watching an episode of Impact, I don't know, three years ago or so, and I think Josh Matthews was doing a heel thing, and he took some weird swipe at you for promoting your book, and I thought, that was, where did that even come from? Was there anything there at all? Do you even know what I'm referring to, or? No, I don't. Never, I don't even know who Josh Matthews is, but <laughs> I, I don't, no, I, I had never heard of anything. Mm-mm. He said something about he was always hawking that guy who's always hawking his book at at conventions or something when you were when your name was dropped. I thought that's kind of a jerkish comment. Yeah. What was his role? Was oh, Josh Matthews manager? was an announcer for WWE, and now he's basically been the uh, the the jack of all trades for Impact Wrestling since 2014 or 13. So it's been around a while. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I guess. I have no, I, I have nothing to reference that. All right. Yeah. All right. So uh, a couple more questions and I'll let you go. But since we're both New York, New Jersey area kind of guys, uh, the company that you worked for played Madison Square Garden almost a year ago to the day. And that's pretty cool. Let's see Ring of Honor play Madison Square Garden. Can you believe that's the same company and, and all the growing pains and the shrinkage and growing and all the kind of twists and turns they've made? And what do you think of Ring of Honor in 2020? Yeah, that was um that was that was great. I you know, um I I looked at it from a different perspective. Um because I'm not sure that the wrestlers could fully appreciate what a lot of the behind the scenes people put up with mm-hmm. with um uh, McMahon shutting other promotions out of large arenas. I'll give you an example. Um, Gary Jester is the promoter, mm-hmm. and he represented Jim Crockett Promotions. He represented the AWA back in the 80s. Um, he he now is the, um, I think he's the arena booker, but he's a, you know the main promoter for Ring of Honor. So he went through all of those wars against the McMahons in trying to get into arena after arena and was um, turned away time after time after time. It was only um, the Baltimore arena that um, said to McMahon's people got to the Baltimore Arena and said, if you continue to have the NWA here, we will never come back. And Baltimore Arena was one of the very few that just looked at them and said, well, that's tough because, you know, NWA does good business here and we're not going to turn them away. Mm -hmm. And then the WWF at the time did not go to the Baltimore Arena. They went down to the Cap Center um, and... uh, but that was unusual. Uh, New Haven Coliseum, we went to. Um, we couldn't get into the main Boston Gardens um, for a while. So I look at the guys in the in the background who now work for Ring of Honor, mm-hmm. who worked for other promotions in the past, who um, the, you know they they tried for decades to get into Madison Square Garden. So when that happened, and it was a uh, day that uh, Josh Matthews probably saw me hawking my book at WrestleCon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hear from it from Josh at some point, I know, because he's, he's, he's not a friend or anything, but I kind of threw him under the bus. I apologize. <laughs> um, yeah, those are the folks that I thought about, you know, the people that had been fighting the war mm-hmm. and now we're presenting, um, you know, the, this young new talent. Um, so, I, yeah, I thought it was... It was uh, sensational. It's amazing how many wrestlers are still there from when I was there in the mid two thousands. Absolutely, so that says a lot, right there. It is. It is. It's one of my favorite wrestling shows to watch because it is wrestling. It's just you can't deny it. that's a, that's if you want a wrestling show, that's a wrestling show. Um. So I'm going to wrap up with you in just a few moments. Uh, two things to say. First, I have to go over the first time we spoke. You told the story about Sid Vicious and Arn Anderson. And I'm chuckling like a giggling schoolgirl in the background because I'm just visualizing this nearly seven-foot foot man banging a chair against a wall, thinking that's just an insane visual to even think about. And I know you were kind of scratching your head thinking, how could somebody laugh at a story where somebody gets stabbed? But it's just such a bizarre thing to... To, to even have any kind of output outside of the wrestling industry, outside looking in, that's pretty crazy to think about. Yeah, I, over the years, I, I, I don't know, um, I don't know why, but I would find myself in the middle of some of the most talked about 
episodes, you know, like the night uh, Mick Foley lost his ear. Right, right. You know, the night of that, that uh, scissor fight or whatever it was. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess if you're around for 40 years, that you're apt to be in one of those places at one of those times, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you're the one who caught the ear, if I recall. From uh, uh, you held on to mix mix ear, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. From uh, the French referee DDA Gep. Yes. <laughs> awesome. And the final question is kind of a layup, and it's: um, Did you have any way that you wanted the fans to know where they could get in contact with Gary Michael Capetta, and any events coming up that you'd like to talk about? Um, I'm on, um, Twitter at Gary Capetta mm -hmm. and, um, on Facebook, G M C my initials, the number four real G M C four real. And on um, Facebook, I've got a patrons page that people can subscribe to. And for instance, I've, um, posted a three part video talking about my AEW adventures, which I haven't posted on, um, you know, on my public pages. Oh. So anything that happens, you know, behind the scenes or, and sometimes I'll, I'll critically look at, at certain product that I reserve just for the patrons page. Um, they can go there in the left column, click fan subscription. That's on Facebook, GMC number four, real. So that those would be the two places to go. Awesome. And do you do any conventions at this point? Um, I have, but I am taking a little bit of uh, time away. A siesta. <laughs> um, you know, I'm open to uh, you know if a promoter wants to get in touch with me. Um, I've been asked to do the stage show up in New York State, and we're talking about it. I've been uh, asked to do some guest ring announcing down in Arkansas, and we're talking about it. Um, so, you know, I'm open to going out, but I'm just not initiating it. Awesome, awesome. Well, like I said, as a, as a fan who literally grew up watching you, I, I was watching wrestling in the, in the mid-80s, and I had, you know, tapes of you in the WWF. I do go back to that era, and I, of course, can still in my head, just hearing you talk, I can hear you introducing Fly and Brian and the Z-Man and so many guys that, that you know, your announcing was such a big part of their career. So it was cool to see you back on Wednesday night, and I appreciate you taking the time to do this with me here on this Tuesday night. Thank you. It's been fun. I appreciate it. Before I let you go, can I ask for one favor? And no, I'm not going to ask you to announce anything. <laughs> you, had, All right. you had jokingly said that about uh, uh, once before. Can I get an ID, a drop, just saying this is Gary Michael Capetta, and you're listening to the Wrestling Epicenter? Hey, wrestling fans, this is Gary Michael Capetta, and you're listening to the Wrestling Epicenter. Perfect. So I guess I kind of did ask you to announce something. <laughs> you did. That was sneaky. It was sneaky, and I won't forget that. <laughs> All right. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, sir. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Could you drop me a link, and I'll, uh, I'll post it on my social media pages. Absolutely.